Welcome to week 11. We're almost done. Um, what we're going to be diving into this week is transactions. Um, as a fundamental, fundamental concept, important. Um, and it's one of those topics that's either you cover it and cover the basics, or you cover it and do an entire university term on it. And of course, I didn't say college term. Uh, I know for a fact Carlton in one of their computer science programs literally has an entire semester dedicated to this topic, like an entire course just for this. Uh, as you can guess, we're not dedicating an entire course to this. Um, but we'll cover what's important about it. In actual fact, let me just get rid of one light before I continue. There we go. We'll cover what's important about it and what it actually does and how you use them. And I'll do a little demo so you guys visually see what happens. All right. So we're going to talk about transactions themselves, uh, essentially recovery, and we'll talk about concurrency issues. All right. So a transaction is a an action or a series of action carried out by a single user or an application which reads or updates the contents of a database. So that pretty much sounds like every single insert, update, and delete you guys have learned about. And technically, yes, even a single insert counts as a transaction. However, when we talk about the term transaction as applied to database, Depending which database engine you're working with, it gets a little weird. Um, specifically, Oracle treats everything as a transaction by default. Postgres, you have to tell it to be in a transaction. Same thing with Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, MySQL, you have to actually create your database properly. Otherwise, you say, hey, start a transaction. MySQL says yes, and then it ignores you just like a child. Um, so. You have to create the database a specific way. Um, if you guys remember to lab one, when I had you check a setting called for NODB, that's telling you that it can do transactions by default. Um, so to be a little more precise as to what a transaction is, I'm actually gonna do the stuff on the right half of the slide and then talk about the stuff on the left. Uh, a transaction is a logical unit of work when applied to a database. Each transaction does something to the database and no part of it alone achieves anything of use or interest. Let's picture this way. You're laying on your back, your eyes are closed, your alarm just went off. The transaction will succeed if you're standing with your eyes open. Cool. So you start going through the process. You open your eyes, tell the clock to shut up which I can with mine, because mine responds to voice. Uncover myself, put my feet on the side of the bed, try to get up and decide, now I'm done for today, and I go back to bed. Transaction failed. If I have managed to stand up and keep my eyes open, that's a successful transaction. Each of these is multiple steps. However, the whole unit is considered one operation, and every step inside that operation must succeed. It's a bit like um, you guys have learned about functions in Python, right? writing your own functions or your own methods, depending on what you want to use. And you can actually put in a um, try, catch, fail kind of thing. And if anything fails, like any instruction there has an error, it gets caught and then it fails out gracefully, theoretically. Not usually, but theoretically. Transactions do something similar. So, a transaction is essentially the unit of recovery. There's four properties. Atomicity. And I managed to say it right this time. I have such a hard time with that word for some unknown reason. Uh, consistency, isolation, and durability. Those are the four characteristics that make up a transaction. The acronym is ACID. So, atomicity, or sometimes we'll just say atomic. Um, a transactions are atomic. They don't have parts in concept. 
It can be executed partially. It should not be detectable that they interleave with another transaction. In other words, one transaction that is occurring is invisible to everything else because the entirety of it is considered one single operation, even if there's multiple steps. Therefore, it can't be visually seen from the outside. The other thing is, is once it's on the inside, it can't see outside either. So you could have dozens of transactions running in parallel. Consistency. The database takes, the transaction takes the database from one consistent state into another. In the middle of the transaction, the database might not be consistent with whatever it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, I have like the best example for this and I'll be discussing it in a moment. Isolation. So a transaction is not visible to anything else until it completes successfully. If it fails, it's like it never even happened. So a transaction starts, things start, you start making changes to the database, a command goes horribly wrong for whatever reason, the whole thing pretends it never even happened. So from the outside, in other words, something that's not a transaction, either it happens or it does not. Pulls a Yoda, it, do or do not, there's no try. So there's no try in a transaction. Either it does it or it doesn't. Either it does or it does not do it. And isolation is a consequence of being atomic because the whole thing is treated as a single unit. Therefore, on the outside, they only see one thing happening. They don't see all the individual pieces. Durability. Durability means once a transaction is completed, the changes are permanent. Even if the system crashes, the effects of the transaction must remain in place. There's things put, there are, there's technology in place in every database to recover gracefully if something goes wrong during a transaction. All right, so we're gonna transfer in this case, it's um, 50 pounds. I, that used to be a dollar sign, interesting. Uh, transfer 50 pounds from account A to account B. This is something we all understand. We have two bank accounts, checking and savings. At least here in Canada, you know, those are your two choices. And let's just say you have $100 in your savings account and you went on a bender last night and you now have $0 in your checking account. And it's time to go buy some groceries. So you're going to transfer some money from your savings to your checkings. So we're going to take 50 bucks from one account, put it into the other account. What most of you guys don't realize, you don't actually think about what a bank is doing. And each bank basically does the same way. Now, I know for a fact that the order they do it in might be slightly different. CIBC does it one way and Royal does it a different way. Uh, BMO, sometimes I think they just roll the dice. Um, but what they do, and let me grab a marker and I'll do it on the board instead of trying to just point it on the whatever. All right. So we have, what happened to my marker? Okay. We have account A, account B. A has $0 in it. Account B has say 150. I'll be a little generous. All right. So we have $150. Currently down the side here, I am going to say our total is 150. We're just going to keep track of what's happening. Now, we want to transfer $50 from here to here. And we'll do it the CIBC way. Begin transaction. Is issued. What happens here now is account A gets a plus 50. Currently, B. It's still at 150. So now our total is $200. Then what happens is I say 50 here. So now suddenly we're at 50 here, 100 here, and we're back to 150. All said and done. At this point in time, this is the commit which we'll be talking about the commit later. But 
between here and here, the database is in a state of flux. We started with 150. We have to end with 150. What happens in the middle is anybody's guess. So, guess at CIBC, what they do is they credit one account, debit the other account, and Royal actually debits the account, then credits the account. They just do it, you know, the order is different. And they attend, they essentially do the same thing in the end. So this is what this example is talking about over here. Um, so for things to be atomic, we shouldn't be able to take money from here without putting it in here. Okay. Consistent. When you start, you got 150. When you end, you've got 150. That's consistency. In other words, the database stays consistent from when it started to when it ended. Isolation. Um, doesn't really apply here, but in theory, while this is happening, I've gone to uh, Rotten Ronnie's here and tapped for a burger at the same time as you did the transfer. The odds of that actually happening are like, you know, you'd have a better chance of winning the Lotto Max like four times in a row than to actually make that transaction happen the exact same time. But, you know, theoretically it's possible. So what could happen is you could actually do a tap, but we wouldn't even be aware that you're transferring money. So that's isolation. Durability. Once the money is in this account, it doesn't go back to the other account unless you choose to put it back yourself. Like it doesn't magically transpose itself back because then it wouldn't be very durable if you go, hey, I put 50 bucks in my account and now the 50 bucks is gone, but magically it's back in my savings account, but I didn't do anything. Can you imagine the chaos? So that's uh, durability. So any questions about this so far? Because we haven't really gotten into the technical details. We've just been discussing what it does. Does that is that pretty clear, this example? Pretty straightforward? Okay. All right. So every database server that supports transactions has something called a transaction manager. Every database server does it differently. Of course they do. Because they were all independently created away from each other. Therefore, the developers, even though our following very similar concepts are going to do things slightly differently. So locks and or tamp stamps are used to ensure consistency and isolation. So what happens is it starts a transaction and while the transaction is operating, it will, it will lock access to certain tables. That's on, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Less well-developed uh, databases, let's say. Um, database servers actually create a memory in memory snapshot. So they actually snapshot what you're operating against so that it's completely isolated. A log is kept for durability in the event of system failures. So what happens is whenever you run, you start a transaction and you do an insert and update or a delete, those changes aren't applied to the database at that moment, they're actually written out to a log and then applied to the database. It's basically um, saying, hey, database, I'm going to take $50 from here. It writes it into a log and then the database engine will read the log and replay the commands from there. Because usually it's faster for it to write to a log than it is to write to the database. Therefore, there's a better chance that the log will survive. So the transaction manager enforces all the asset properties. It controls the operations of the transactions. If two transactions are started on the same data table, it actually runs them in sequence. So first one, second one, third one. And two commands called commit and rollback are used to ensure that each instruction is atomic or each transaction is atomic. Okay, so a rollback means the transaction failed. So imagine 
we started doing this again. But for some unknown reason, something fluctuated here. So we tried to do a an update and it couldn't do the minus 50. Instead of that, what it would do is instead of a commit, it would do a rollback and bring us back to this state here as if none of this ever happened. That's a rollback. It is the closest you'll ever find to undo in a database. Which is why by default, for example, Oracle runs in transaction mode at all times. You create a table, it's in a transaction. You insert rows into that table. It's still part of the same transaction until you issue an explicit commit command. None of it actually ever happened. MySQL goes the other way around. It runs in auto commit mode as does Postgres and Microsoft SQL Server. They, they operate by default in that mode that everything's auto committed, which as you guys experienced last semester, you could do your insert commands and you'd go run and poof, stuff happens and it's there and everybody's happy. That's because it's running in auto commit mode. Is there, is one better than the other? There's advantages and disadvantages to both. Transactions occupy more memory. Transactions are a little more CPU bound. They're a little more IO intensive. Thus they're a little more expensive, but by the same token, you don't have to trust the stupid programmer to know to start a transaction. So, yeah. If you issue the rollback command, it goes right back to the where you, you issued the begin. Nope. No, it rolls it all back. There are things we could do to to allow it to do that. But realistically, um, in my career, I've never used checkpoints, which that's what that would be. I think we're going to talk about checkpoints towards the end of this. But essentially, a rollback rolls back the whole thing. A commit, on the other hand, you did every command successfully. You issue a commit, life is good. All right. The second the commit is issued, the changes are now visible to everybody on the outside because at that point it's as if it happened. Okay. Now talk about a bit, bit about a bit. It's been a really long day. Let's talk a bit about recovery. So as a rule of thumb, Prevention is better than a cure, right? We know you shouldn't do stupid shit, so you don't have to fix your problem later. So we should try to be preventative. Um, you should have a reliable operating system. That usually means that, you know, your operating system is patched and up to date and People laugh about really old operating systems, but you know, there's something to be said about some of the really old operating systems. They were bulletproof. I honestly would not have run a business for a database on like Windows NT4 or Windows 2000. Server 2012 and up, pretty stable. Windows Server. Uh, Linux, usually pretty stable. Um, depends on what you're using. Ubuntu Server, Cool. Red Hat, fantastic. CentOS, good. Arch Linux, you're an idiot. Um, the only people that use Arch are people that are trying to flex. Or at least that go around saying, ha, I run Arch. Cool. Um, so you want to pick a variable OS. You want to make sure security is up to snuff. We talked about that last week. You probably should have a UPS and or surge protectors. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a UPS is, it's a battery. You plug your server in the battery, power goes out, the battery keeps the server alive until you can do a graceful shutdown or until the power comes back. RAID arrays. Uh, how many people in here know what a RAID array is? Okay, right. like four hands. You're not going to learn about RAID arrays very much in here. Just putting it out there. A RAID array stands for a RAID. Um, Array of some people say the I stands for something else, but essentially you have a bunch of drives and it's operating in one of several modes. It could be mirroring, it could be striping, could be mirroring and striping. 
which is RAID 1, RAID 0, and row RAID 1 plus 0. There's also RAID 5, 6, 60, 50, 10, and one other one. I don't remember what it is. There's all kinds of different RAID modes. For example, I have a media server at home with a drive enclosure. I've got five drives in it. Four of them are running in a RAID 5 array. It means I can lose one whole drive, just turn it off, pull it out, put another one in, rebuild the array. I lose nothing. What does the RAID array protect you from? Disk failure. Um, I wouldn't trust that RAID array to run financials. <laughs> just saying. But you'd buy an actual proper thing. Well, you can't protect against everything. Remember last week I talked about how the plumbing was above a server rack? That's something if dude upstairs drops a log and it clogs the toilet and it floods. There's no amount of physical preparation you can do to save yourself from that. So transactions should be durable, but we can't prevent things like a system crash. Anybody who thinks Linux does not crash is deluding themselves. It crashes. Spectacularly. Power failures. Uh, those who have been in Ottawa long enough have experienced the tornadoes and the derecho, what's it called? I think it was a derego, derecho, something like that. When, uh, you know, my neighborhood had no power for 10 days. That's what my generator was for. Went through a lot of gas. This crashes. Hardware failure. User mistakes. Uh, sabotage and natural disasters. So. The server, the database server, has a transaction log. The transaction log records the details of all transactions. So any changes the transaction would make to the database gets written into the log. It also keeps track of how to undo these changes. And it tracks when it completes and if it completes successfully or not. The log is stored on disk. It's never in memory. So if the server blue screens as if it's a Windows server or it uh, get a kernel panic if it's Linux or a Unix system, this just, it will survive the fact that the whole server just took seizure. So it uses something called the write ahead log. So the wall. The entry in the log must be made before the commit processing can complete. So in other words, every step must be in there including the, this succeeded before the commit's actually processed. So it literally writes out the instructions of everything you're gonna do, then it does it. So at various times, a database server takes what's called a checkpoint. What that does is it reads the, the commit log, the write ahead log, and it plays it back, then actually physically applies it to the disk. So you've got the server, it writes to the transaction log every second, because it actually is very, very fast. Every second or so, even half a second, it will check that file and see if it changed. If it changed, it reads it and applies the changes to the, physically applies it to the disk. So as each transaction is running, it's keeping this log up to date. It gives each transaction um, an ID, and it says transaction A, step one, transaction A, step two, transaction B, step one, and it's all in this file. So a system failure means that all currently running transactions are affected. So if there's a power outage, software crashes, and as long as the physical disks aren't damaged, the database server will be able to recover itself from the wall. Now, what's some nifty things about it and I've tested this over the years. Uh, it's actually really hard to actually successfully test this, but I, but you can. Um, I wanted to see how well it recovered. So what's the best way to test if server is recovering from something? Start a really long transaction, pull the plug out of the back. And then it makes a really bad noise. It's a really sad sound. Then you plug it back in and it turns back on. And then you see if your database came back from the dead. So what happens is on reboot, when the database service starts up, it looks at the binary log and it replays the transactions that it knows it hasn't finished writing out. 
So it will recover them. All right. So from here on out, there's going to be this graph that you're going to see up on the screens. And we're going to talk about the different states a transaction is in. And this is the graph as complete. We're going to go through each of the stages in a minute. All right. So any transactions that was running at the time of failure need to be undone and restarted. Any transactions that were committed since the last checkpoint just need to be redone. So in that previous slide, type one doesn't need a recovery. Type two and four need to be just redone. Type three and five need to be undone and refired off. And now I'll actually, you'll actually watch the timeline move in a minute. So in the transaction, there will be, each command will have two states, undo and redo. Undo is for any transaction that's not completed and marked complete. Redo is if a transaction actually finishes, but it hasn't been committed to the disk yet. So essentially the rule is, is undo any transactions that are still running during the last checkpoint. Redo should be empty at the beginning. Um, so if a begin transaction entry is found, the transaction is added to the undo. So let's, let's draw, let's do this line here. So we have transaction one and right now we have, see right here, this green line, that's a checkpoint. So you're going to see this line slowly moving towards the right. So transaction one started and completed before the checkpoint. All right. So what's happening right now is transaction one, nothing needs to happen to it. It's been checkpointed. It's been written to the disk. It's permanent. Transaction two and transaction three have been started. They're currently operating. They're operating during the checkpoint. So that means transaction two and three have been added to the undo pile because they're currently running, but they haven't completed successfully yet. Therefore, we don't know if they're going to, we, we can't assume it's going to work. Therefore, they're in a state of undo. And then the, the line starts moving towards the right. Transaction four begins. So transaction four will be added to the undo pile. So right now, transaction two, three, and four are currently undo. So if the if I were to walk to the server right now and pull the plug out of the back, when the server restarts, it would undo transactions two, three, and four. Because none of them reached a point where they were complete. They were never reached a point of commit. Therefore, they're going to get undone. Now, timeline keeps moving. Transaction five begins. It gets also added to the undo pile. Suddenly we see a big pile of transactions that are currently processing. Everything's sitting in the undo pile. Fantastic. Line moves a little more. Transaction two commits. Transaction two goes from undo into redo. So now transaction two is complete onto itself. It's successful. Dan reaches behind the server and yanks the plug. Waits for one minute like you're supposed to. Plug it back in. Server reboots. Reads the log. Says, oh, transaction two was successful. Let's, but it was not marked as completed. Therefore, let's redo transaction two. Done. Transaction four commits. So now transaction four will move to the redo pile. And if I were to fire off a checkpoint right now, Two and four would now go be written to the disk and be discarded because they've been checkpointed. However, we haven't had a checkpoint yet because, oh, I thought there was one more. Because right after this, Dan pulls the plug. See this last line on the right here that says failure? That's Dan pulling the plug out of the server. So that means that transaction two and four will be redone. Transaction three and five are not going to be redone. They're going to be undone. This will allow a database to stay consistent because we have commands that successfully finished. All right. So 
We have forwards and backwards recovery. Transactions need to be redone. Those are the ones in the redo pile. So working forwards through the log, it'll command one, command two, command three. So you're going from top to bottom. And that'll be the redo list that'll bring the database up to date. However, at the same time, there's another process reading the log file in reverse order, looking for anything that needs to be undone. And it plays all those commands in reverse order. So you did insert into table A, insert into table B, update something in table B. It'll play them backwards. It'll go under the update, under the insert, under the insert. So it's as if you're doing a control Z. Because control Z doesn't go to the beginning. It plays backwards from the last thing you did, right? And then if you do control Y, or control shift Z because nobody can agree what redo is, it'll go in the opposite direction and rebuild all the steps you did. So that's what's called forwards and backwards recovery. It goes forward for things that are completed, backwards for things that need to be undone. Okay, so media failures. So, disk crashes are way more serious. How many of you have ever experienced a hard drive dying? An actual hard drive. Not your SSD magically become having less and less memory. Having your hard drive actually die. It's good time, eh? Yeah, he's shaking his head when I said good time. It, it, if you're of a certain vintage of age, you remember the click of death. You turn on your computer and it's booting, it's going to soon, and suddenly you hear tick. 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 That's because it's actually hitting a bad sector and it's trying to read it and it's slamming the head back and forth. Or your computer is running and then the place vibrates. And modern hard drives are much better protected than they used to be. I remember hearing the scrape sound of a head, head hitting the disc. Right? A head crash. That's a good one, too, which is the one you were referring to, right? Like the head touches the disc and scratches it. That, that's another good one. The other one is, um, okay, I'm really going to age myself here. I had a Commodore 64. And once I caught a virus on my Commodore 64, people didn't even think viruses existed back then. And I actually met the person that wrote this virus. What, an odd, what the odds are that I ran into them. So, what people don't realize is the Commodore 64 was a really cool piece of tech. The floppy drive actually had a CPU and memory of its own. And the way things ran fast is they actually wrote programs that would be loaded from your main computer into the floppy drive, and they would do all the operations and just transmit what's needed. So it would actually execute in the floppy drive to speed things up. Cool tech. Uh, except like this guy wrote a virus that would tell it to seek track negative 55. So it's reading, 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 and suddenly the head would just slam literally against the side of the, you'd hear it hit the side of the floppy drive because he caused it to go back so hard. It didn't actually damage your drive. It just sounded horrible. That's another thing that could happen to your physical disk is literally have the head go. So physical disks are brutal. The thing is that data centers still use them because bang for the buck, like the amount of terabytes for the money is still unparalleled. Like you can buy 22 gig drives. I mean, 22 terabyte hard drives. Like our laptops have what, 512 gigs to a terabyte? Maybe some of you have really splurged and got like a two terabyte drive. I, a 22 terabyte NAS drive, and then you put a whole lot of them in a server and you got lots of space. So we still use physical disks. So the problem is when the hard drive fails, it actually physically damages the data. Unlike your SSD that just forgets the data exists, it actually physically scrapes the drive. Um, so the transaction log, it's may actually be damaged. What do you do to avoid that? Keep the transaction log on another disk and maybe mirror that disk so if one fails, you still have the other one. Um, 
a lot of people will actually use solid state drives nowadays for the transaction log because they're instant and there's no moving parts. And the transaction log is tiny, so it really won't wear out that SSD ever. Um, system failures aren't so bad because it's only what's affected since the last checkpoint. Uh, that can be recovered using the transaction log. Uh, backups, we talked about that already, so I'm going to skip this slide, but you guys get the idea from backups. Um, so recovery from media failure. Normally you'd restore it from a backup, and then you could theoretically use the transaction log to rebuild what happened. So in those few moments when it's unavailable. Uh, if the transaction log is damaged, you can't do step two. So normally you would store the log on a separate physical device. Probably as a physical device, you want it mirrored just to be on the safe side. And it reduces the risk of losing everything in one go. All right. So the last topic of the day is concurrency. So, so far I was just describing transferring money from one account to the other. Now think about how much that happens in one of Canada's big banks. Like, how many money transfers a second do you think is happening at CIBC or at BMO or TD? Or, you know, pick your favorite bank in your home country. Just think about how much money goes through your central banking institutions. So normally it'd be desirable to let them run at the same time. So you get your transactions to run in parallel. That means the database servers have to be able to handle multiple transactions at once. That means things need to be isolated. So back in the day, when computers sucked, I'm talking like, like archaic computers here, like the 60s and early 70s. Transactions existed, but they couldn't be run in parallel. So they were sequential which would mean you'd have a queue for the transactions. So imagine that modern day banks are sequential. You need to borrow some, transfer some money. You start your transfer. In the meantime, he wants to transfer money. He has to wait till you're finished. Now, he wants to transfer money, but he's got to wait till he's finished, but he's waiting for you to finish. So you could just picture like this big giant snowball effect of how long it could take. So we have something called a concurrency manager. So in order to run transactions concurrently, we interleave their operations. So database servers really don't do things, multiple things at once. They just do one thing at a time really fast, just like your computer. So it'll actually start a transaction, start doing things in one place. In the meantime, it'll start another transaction and they'll take turns hitting up the database. So each transaction gets a share of the computing time, also known as preemptive multitasking. However, this leads to all kinds of problems, lost updates, uncommitted updates, incorrect analysis. All this happens because isolation is broken. So what happens with the concurrency is a good database server will not lock the whole table. A good database server locks the row that you're operating against, but it needs to understand what it's operating against. So therefore it will lock the table for a moment, figure out the row, lock the row and unlock the table. So while you're playing with that row, nobody else can make changes. That way, as long as you know not two things are trying to access the same spot, Nobody even realizes that the database is handling thousands of transactions a second because it's being handled. Um, this is actually, this concurrency thing is where most of that university course that I was talking about. They have an entire field of math dedicated to this. And it's a lot of math. Um, it's actually the most complex code in most database engines is handling concurrency. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate, um, what this actually does. 
And what's kind of cool is I'm basically showing you how to do the lab because the demo is literally the lab, um, except I'm not doing it with the tables from the lab. But I'm showing you guys basically how the lab works. Okay. So I got MySQL Workbench loaded, nice and happy. I am going to connect twice. I've got two tabs open. You'll notice that they're two separate, they have different names because they're two separate connections. Everybody understands that so far. I've got a table called Transaction Demo. So I'm going to go select star from, and I'm going to make this big. Just show you guys the state of my table and, oh, it's trans demo. Oh. I've got a, a bunch of names in here, okay? And just show you guys that I am playing against the same spot. It's the same thing both sides, okay? So we're looking at the same data. So normally what you guys have experienced is you get all see how shitty I am at typing. I used to be really good, but things you lose skill after a while. Name, values. Okay, so I run this command. I go select star from trans demo. And I run this. I go, boom, here's Jimmy. The other tab is also showing Jimmy. So, so far, so good. This is called auto commit. I created a row. It's there immediately. Now, let me issue a begin command. Begin tells the database server, Bruh, you're starting a transaction. Everything you see from here on out, make it happen, but don't let it hit the disk until I tell you it's allowed to happen. Okay? And we're going to add a Donna. There we go. So I'm going to hit go. We can see Donna down here, right? I'm going to go to my second tab, and I'm going to hit go. No Donna. So remember earlier I was talking about isolation. So what's happening right now is I've started a transaction over here. It's not committed yet. So everything that's happening inside the transaction is happening in memory, more or less, and it only exists within the transaction. So if I were to issue a rollback, so I'm going to go here and go rollback. And I'm going to add my select statement again. And I'm going to do these two things. And I'm going to do rollback. Donna's gone away. Donna never happened. Cool. That's exactly what it's doing, is it creates a temporary instance. Different database servers will do it differently. It will be like, they'll write every, all database servers write things to a log. But some of them will do it in, will do all the work in memory. Some will actually do it on the disk. And what it does after the server comes back changes, but essentially the same thing. So this time I'm going to begin my transaction again. And let's prove to you that yes, Donna still doesn't exist. Now I'm going to issue a commit. And I'm going to just run the commit. And you can see that down here says zero rows affected. And now Dawn exists in my second connection because I committed the change. Now, the view queries the live data. So the view would be behaving like tab two. The view still does not see what's happening inside the transaction. All right. So, so far, so good. I am going to begin this. I'm going to go. Um, update, trans demo, set name equal to where ID is equal to. Uh, 
16. Jimmy is going to become, is going to become uh, Janie. So I'm going to begin this. Transaction is currently happening. If we look at our second catch, Jimmy is still Jimmy. However, I'm now going to go update. I'm going to actually grab my update command from here. And this one will become Jones. I'm trying to play with the same record. Okay. I'm going to hit go. You will notice down here it says it's running. And running. Does anybody, can anybody guess why it's still running forever? Because the row is locked on the other one. So I began a transaction. Right now I'm trying to update row ID 16. It's the transaction manager knows that that row is currently in a state of flux. So it's saying, by the way, you don't get to make your changes until I finish. So now if I issue a commit here and I go select star from trans demo, And I'm missing my semicolon there. So I'm going to run these two things. Here's Janie. Lost the connection. I took actually too long <laughs> to do the demo. Okay. And we, um, what? This is. So this one shows Janie. If I run it now, it says Joan. So normally this demo, I do it with another database engine, Postgres. Postgres is so fast that by the time the commit happened, you do the select story, would have actually applied the other transaction <laughs> to it. Uh, MySQL, on the other hand, is a little pokey. So what it does, what happened is issued the, the transaction. It started the transaction, started updating the records. It committed. In the meantime, the other one that was waiting is saying, hey, it's my turn now. And it applies its changes because it was writing in an auto commit stage. In other words, it wasn't in a transaction. Its changes are applied immediately. It just so happens that MySQL is a little special. If I had run the commit command and then the select, Separately, you might have actually seen the fluctuation between the data, which leads me to the last item. Last one wins. So when you've got a couple of different transactions running at the same time, and they're all trying to touch that record, the last one to run is the one that's going to win. Because it's going to treat them sequentially. So it's going, oh, Jimmy became Janie, now Janie became Joan. It's literally going to run them in that order. Therefore, the last one to run will always win. Um, but yeah, that's literally what transactions do. You just got to see it happening live. It's actually one of the easiest demos to do. It's a little surprising. So the lab will have you create a table, insert some rows, now, some people panic that their row count match doesn't match the person next to them. That's because some people insist on running that insert three or four times. So instead of like 200 rows, they might have like, or like instead of 100 rows, they have like 300 rows. What I'm watching is for the change in numbers further in. So further in, it's getting you to do an insert, an update, or an insert, and a delete, or whatever. And it's getting you to watch between the two tabs, just like what I just did. So you'll see on one side, I had whatever. X number of rows on the other side, it's X. Heck, I can even show that a little bit better. I can go undo, 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 undo. Okay. Um, I'm going to put in a Davy and we're going to count this, all the rows. Okay. Currently, this shows 10 rows. 
I run this command, it shows 11. I run this command, it shows 10. I issue a commit. And now this one shows 11 also. That's literally what the lab's getting you to do, it's to count the differences. It's not a hard lab. Don't panic if you, you know, one of you just wasn't paying attention. They ran the insert like four times. I'm watching to see if you're giving me, oh, it went up by one, went down by one, went up by one, went down by one. So that's what I'm what I'm looking for. So as you can see, I'm addressing concerns people have had over the years <laughs> preemptively. All right. So that, folks, is transactions in a nutshell. Um, the fact is, by default, MySQL does not support transactions unless you turn them on for your tables. You will notice that in the lab, um, let me pull up the lab just so that I can point it out. As lab, uh, lab eight, All right, historically I've seen cases where this, people would run it without this, where it says in ODB. Just make sure it's there. Uh, we used to use the world database, and the world database was set with a different table type and it didn't do transactions, so. So, see this for number one once and then clear your, your editor. Don't keep rerunning all that stuff. Okay. That's it, folks. Uh, that's the lab.